Alright, and we seem to be live. Привет, чушпаны. I am back <laughs> from my travels and I'm desperately trying to plug myself back into the matrix. And um, I would hate t- talking about my vacation because it has little to do with our podcast uh, topic. So I just like to uh, like to announce it on Twitter because uh, like clockwork it provokes excellent reactions in the replies <laughs> such as how dare you boast about going to resort while enabling an illegal war <laughs> well it does feel pretty nice vacation i mean uh, so in a great hurry i was trying to come up with some topics right away Uh, upon my return to record something Um, and uh, you could ask me but Nikolai uh, why wouldn't Kirill help you out with that Uh, uh, you were so busy swimming in the ocean and tanning your pale pale butt on the beach and you see um, (coughs) it's impossible to spring Kirill into action lately it's as if uh, talking to a celebrity Uh, who doesn't want to spare his precious time (laughs) i've Uh, been extremely busy as of late but it's gonna be a bit easier now i have more time and uh, i will try to bring you some Mm. uh, solo content maybe in my downtime Uh, i think uh, uh, people liked the the last radio desert i think Uh, so i'm gonna try to do something similar yes and uh Can you believe it? Yesterday, Kirill tried to fake a microphone malfunction in order to not record anything. Uh, He literally said uh, psh psh into the mic, (laughs) thinking that I am gonna fall for it. Just an incredible guy. So, yeah, maybe it's hibernation or, yeah, work, as he says. But (laughs) I guess I feel more productive uh, since I became a father, actually. And it concerns uh, everything, work, podcasting, even leisure. Uh, because uh, in my travel i couldn't really sit idly at the hotel anymore and uh, yeah i enjoyed being uh, a crazy russian dad uh, with an infant on a speedboat on a remote island <laughs> <and all. laughs> so yeah i guess uh, you will also glow up uh, when you become a father I, I also, think it works yeah. like that, yeah. <laughs> Still, uh, there, there actually are interesting things that are worth discussing. Um, but before that, uh, what are you drinking, Kirill? I am drinking uh, y- yerba mate. I think it's pronounced oh, this way. Oh. But I also have some yeah. buffalo trace bourbon at uh, uh, the table. Maybe it's okay to drink during a work week. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I am having just coffee right now i've been uh, i am not in the condition to to uh, drink today i think i had a little to drink last night to to uh, wind down after a very uh, busy and stressful two weeks and uh, i must say that uh, getting older is not a good thing you you guys should never get old just just die in your 20s it's uh, preferable but you're uh, also the... in your twenties still. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, but really, the the wine uh, was really a test for my constitution mm. in that sense, and uh, yeah. So I'm not gonna drink anything tonight. Yeah. Other than coffee and water. Although we have a celebration because we yes. hit uh, 300k on Twitter yesterday or was it yeah i think oh, technically it's today so yeah uh, if you want to congratulate uh, congratulate us with this hap- well uh, what is it called anniversary milestone mm. uh, yeah. and uh, yeah so hit us with some message or a question uh, via the link in the description and send um, you can send us a few bucks this way and yes, so, on the topic of anniversaries, yeah. we, we actually missed uh, the three-year anniversary of We RWA. always do that, actually. We always <laughs> miss the anniversary. Yes, actually, it was anniversary. just a, f- a few weeks ago. A few weeks yeah. ago. We, it's oh. Three years. Yeah, it's not that... Uh, it's pretty impressive, actually. Three years for a podcast. It's uh, yeah. just like a century. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, if you had told me three years ago that we would hit 300,000 followers on Twitter, I would not have believed you. Well, yeah. Well, to be fair, it's mostly of um, uh, your own fault because <laughs> you were responsible for much of our <laughs> Twitter success. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. And probably most of our followers thinks, uh, think that we are some kind of lazy news outlet, <laughs> 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 which is incredibly lazy and uh, <laughs> just randomly goes uh, on the tangent about, uh, I don't know, some memes or vacation stuff. <laughs> it's weird, but it is what it is. Uh, I hope you enjoy our Twitter, though. I think it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, first topic will be... And uh, up, uh, when I arrived home, and actually earlier, when I was uh, torturing myself at the hotel while trying to watch a local TV, and there are only American TV uh, media... Uh, channels and whatnot msnbc and uh, cnn and there's british bbc so yeah i was in the be belly of the beast so to speak and um, i have uh, not seen anything ukraine related well i'm not i wasn't big on tv but still it was all about israel or local things or uh, markets so uh, and um, Besides, there is a clear doomer wave going in the camp of Ukraine supporters lately on the internet. And in general, it feels that uh, Ukraine as a nation and AFU is losing morale and steam. Uh, many pundits are switching sides uh, or uh, blackpilling their audience. Just look at uh, Aristovich, and who is now, I believe, an American expert. And he is blackpilling his audience like no one else. And Ukrainians that I see online are also completely exhausted. It's as if they finally saw some... They, they lost their, this faulty optimism that they had uh, for nearly two years. And yeah, now, it, it, it's, actually, yeah. it's actually really bizarre because they all started doing it exactly the same time. Yeah despite nothing really dramatic happening like nothing there were no major changes that uh, like in the physical reality that would have prompted them to suddenly start dooming because all the factors they are dooming about have been true for many many months and uh, basically it's weird it's like they all got a memo to to start backpilling yeah and I a think... bunch of uh, and a yeah. bunch of accounts have also shut down well, the th the way they coped about it, uh, they spotted some um, bl glaring internal Russian problems or conflicts, and Prigozhin was the main source of that. And uh, he, uh, so, how many months uh, after Prigozhin's death there were? Did he die in August? I believe this is the case. So yeah, uh, Prigozhin, then Avdiyevka, then maybe Marinka, and that's pretty much it for morale uh, of our enemies at this point. Or it seems this way. But yeah, uh, so uh, the, their Western handlers are doing damage control or some of them preparing actively them for, uh, for negotiations. And uh, it feels like... Um, um, I don't know, slow, painful death of uh, this country's uh, morale, or yet it another stage of it. Yeah, it it unironically <clears throat> makes me anxious though, because uh, now I'm paranoid about uh, the Americans making Kiev uh, like enter negotiations and uh, the Kremlin doing mm -hmm. the usual Kremlin thing and uh, signing whatever shitty peace deal they offer. That yeah, suck. and uh, and yeah, it's like uh, Mr. Dugin said. Uh, one of his most uh, uh, truthful aphorisms is that nothing can inspire such ha such fear in our people as news of negotiations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, it seems a bit yeah organized even. Uh, so yeah, there is something to it. Um, but um, in the meantime, uh, Ukrainians that I see online, not all of them are uh, doing any anything about war related, not necessarily. Uh, so they. Uh, it's it was uh, two years already for millions of ukrainians who lived in the west uh, well uh, and uh, those who moved to the west they kind of became this uh, nomadic force uh, yanichar nomadic force and um, uh, of course it doesn't concern those ukrainians who moved to russia after the start of the war or who were already in Russia and because those uh, became Russians uh, with the Ukrainian flavor but uh, there is something peculiar happening in the Ukrainian diaspora uh, in the West and uh, they're kind of stuck because, uh, because, because of the internet it's actually very hard to assimilate now I think it was much was uh, much easier back in the day because you, for example, you are uh, you escaped from the Bolsheviks, right? And you moved to France. And what do you do there uh, to make a living? You had to learn French, and uh, your kids will definitely become French immediately. Uh, now, with the help of the internet, you can be. Uh, speak any language actually and you can make money anywhere so you can live in Canada and uh, make money for off Russia or Ukraine and you can stay in this bubble forever forever so it raises a question will there be any kind of assimilation or maybe we will see it uh, in the next gen generation of the Ukrainian nomads but yeah um, but I think it comes down to the finances in the end and uh, uh, who is paying who and uh, this war also comes down to the money question uh, the amount of support that uh, Ukraine receives and uh, as long as there are any money directed to Ukraine or the Ukrainian diaspora in any way uh, they will remain in their place but um, the moment it stops uh, everything will change uh, very quickly so yeah um, but it's not actually a topic it's just uh, some random observation I'm sorry it's a live stream it wasn't very really <laughs> well prepared but uh, let's briefly recap uh, what was going on on the front lines the past month Actually. Right, there has been movement uh, almost everywhere um, and small advances also almost everywhere which we haven't seen in quite a long time actually. Um, some small advances in Kharkiv um, uh, just lately uh, a very strong push uh, south of Kremenaya. Uh, you remember maybe the Svatova Kremenaya access where the Ukrainians tried to break through after their successful Kharkiv offensive. Um, and uh, this place was holding firm very long and it's still holding and Russian forces are advancing again. And uh, what they did is they there is a huge forest south of Kremenaya and forests are a really shitty place to fight in. It's uh, really unpleasant to fight in a forest and to advance through a forest, especially. And uh, I have actually no idea why we aren't just uh, dropping napalm on all of these forests. Um, I, re I mean, I know we tried that in, I think it was Shevot Forest, uh, the one in Kharkiv Oblast, uh, but it was too wet and it didn't work. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that is the problem. I have no idea. But uh, in any case, uh, Russian forces pushed uh, into the forest south of Kremenaya, almost reaching the Seversky Donetsk River, which is the border between Donetsk and Hugansk Oblasts in that part. Other than that, of course, um, the, there were some 
significant advances around Bakhmut, basically retaking all the most of the positions that were had been lost in the Ukrainian counteroffensive. If if you remember such a thing as the Ukrainian offensive uh, around Bakhmut, where all the military analysts on Twitter were telling us that the AFU is about to recapture Bakhmut and create a huge encirclement and whatever. And yeah, so Russian forces uh, are on the move again in the direction of Chasov Yar. Um, if you remember the Battle of Bakhmut, uh, Chasov Yar was the place where all the <clears throat> reinforcements and supplies were coming from for the Ukrainian garrison in Bakhmut, uh, just uh, west of it. And uh, yeah, um, Russian forces are now in Bogdanovka, which is a village uh, northeast of Chasov Yar. And it looks like they have decided uh, to basically just turn everything between Bakhmut and Chasov Yar into dust by um, going crazy with the artillery. The shell shortage that occurred sometimes in some places seems definitely over. Um, what I'm hearing is that uh, they, are, they have removed all limits on how much artillery they can use. Uh, no shell rationing and basically they're just going crazy with the artillery and like literally uh, firing at single infantrymen and such. So very unpleasant to be a Ukrainian soldier in that area right now. Um, then further to the south we have the uh, Donbas, uh, of course, um, and the area around Donetsk in particular with two areas where there is uh, big fighting. The most prominent being Avdiivka, um, which is probably the most fortified place on the planet right now and has been for years. It's uh, like the stronghold that the Ukrainians built in 2014 and have since reinforced more and more. And it uh, became a graveyard for many Russian attempts to take it. And now we are finally uh, seeing it start to crumble slowly. Um, Russian forces are advancing in the north and in the south around of Dievka and uh, trying to cut off the logistics for the uh, Ukrainian forces inside of Dievka. I, I can't even call it a city. It's not a city anymore. It's just a big ass castle. And um, so, yeah, the Avdeevka is, of course, like the absolute focal point of the whole Ukrainian defense in that sector and the, well, basically all Ukrainian presence uh, around Donetsk. Uh, it's also where they have been shelling Donetsk from. The shelling in Donetsk has gotten a lot less recently since uh, the Russian advances uh, around Avdeevka. And uh, depending on what Russian forces do on the flanks, how far they advance there, how wide they make the encirclement and so on, the Ukrainians might have to retreat quite a bit because they do have like 10 or 15 kilometers of layered defenses behind Avdiivka. So of course they uh, had uh, these current events in mind when they created uh, this uh, defensive system and they do have vast defensive um, lines and fortifications uh, for up to 15 kilometers uh, behind Avdiivka. But if Russian forces advance enough, they can make those positions untenable in the first place. And then uh, basically the Ukrainians would have to retreat at least uh, behind uh, the Vovcha River and uh, possibly even further. So that would be pretty great. But uh, yeah, it all depends on what the Russian forces do on the flanks, like uh, how long the battle, the siege will last, uh, what impact it will have strategically and so on. It all depends on what happens around uh, like Krasnogorovka and Vadinoya and so on, all those places around Avdeevka. And then you have Marienka, of course, the Munagostradalne uh, Marienka. Um, 
a place that has also seen a lot of fighting and is also one of those big fortresses uh, alongside uh, Pesky and Avdeevka. Um, Pesky, of course, we have already taken. And uh, now the pressure has been on Marienka for a while. And it looks like uh, finally all of Marienka or almost all of Marienka uh, has been liberated by Russian forces. And uh, yeah, there is an offensive movement from Marienka actually already to the south into a village called Pabieta and uh, in the direction of Novomikhailovka. Uh, Novomikhailovka is also a heavily fortified area that sits on the right flank of another city that has been extremely annoying for a very long time, namely Ugledar. And a push from Marienka into Novomikhailovka would be great and would be absolutely terrible news for the Ukrainian garrison of Ugledar. And uh, there was some footage recently of uh, the shelling in Novomikhailovka, and they are just firing like full grad volleys into it all the time. And it's uh, probably a very bad place to be a Ukrainian soldier as well right now. So, yeah, most of the fighting is uh, there. Uh, ah, of course, there has been some um, uh, movement around where the Ukrainians uh, started their initial push in the counteroffensive, if you guys even remember what that is. Um, the uh, village of Rabotino, which uh, held out longer than uh, the city of Mariupol against the Ukrainian assaults. Um, Russian forces have pushed the Ukrainians back again, and um, it looks feasible that uh, that whole area will be recaptured sooner or later if the uh, yeah Russian forces put in the effort. I don't know if that is the plan for now, but I have received a photo of uh, Rabotina um, by a friend uh, that which would mean that he was like physically within the line of sight of Kabotino, very close. So, yeah, that's about it, I think. Ah, of course, uh, there is uh, Grinke, the the um, very bizarre uh, Ukrainian choice of strategy to um, create a beachhead on our side of the Dnieper and just like sent in a company a week to get killed by bombs. It, I, I genuinely can't, couldn't tell you what the Ukrainians are trying to do there. Uh, it's like a tiny village um, on the river, and they have established uh, well a beachhead there and dug in, and uh, every day dozens of bombs are dropping on their heads and they can't uh, like put their heads up even for a second and they just die and then they send in new people into the same beachhead but they are not advancing or really doing much of anything other than sit in basements and get shelled and bombed and uh, getting hate drops uh, on their heads and so on so yeah <clears throat> i think that's about it for the front lines in the last weeks <clears throat> well yeah it seems to be uh, the biggest uh, Ukrainian victory was the murder of Ilya Kiva, a former Ukrainian politician uh, who switched sides and lived in Russia and was murdered uh, a week ago in Moscow Oblast, supposedly by SBU agents. Or that's what uh, the Ukrainian media sources are claiming. But yeah, who, who is <laughs> interested in uh, killing... Uh, "Quote unquote Ukrainian traitor," but them. So probably it's their only success. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's <clears throat> of course it's like a really bad look that they can assassinate people in Moscow. Yeah, that uh, undoubtedly it's a bad look. But like as for the assassination itself, I can't say that I am terribly like sad about it. Um, well, I don't really know know the guy. So yeah, I know that he was 
one of these uh, so actually actually there was another um former ukrainian politician who was almost killed right uh, it was uh, but uh, he switched sides back in 2014 it was Tsarev. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes. there are myriads of those assassination attempts, and that's where yes. Ukrainians really excel at, and uh, m a lot of them are successful. Uh, so as far as I um, remember, Ilya Kiva was uh, killed in Moscow Oblast in some village yeah. near yeah. some spa area or something like that, yeah. and he was killed uh, by a hunting rifle. So as to mask, mask it maybe as the mm. hunting <laughs> accident, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, I really not sure. Uh, th those guys who um, switch sides and that's pretty uh, probably. A I good mean, thing, I, right? I would not, I would not put Sarov and Kiva <laughs> in the same. Game. Maybe, I mean, but Sarov has to... been has always been a pro-Russian activist and pro-Russian politician. Okay. Uh, well, well, we don't have to discuss how effective he was in that role, but he was always like officially pro-Russian. While Ilya Kiva uh, used to be a Ukrainian nationalist, and mm. not just a Ukrainian nationalist, he volunteered for the so-called anti-terrorist operation in the Donbas. And He's a fighter. Uh, he was yes, yes, mm, he fought. Interesting. He uh, he eventually became the head of uh, right sector in eastern ukraine that's crazy and, and head of the ator veterans association in poltava and he yes he personally commanded a right sector volunteer unit and uh, uh by his own admission committed war crimes against civilians in the donbass so he freely talked about massacring civilians and shooting civilians during the independence referendum in 2014 and mm -hmm. uh, he publicly called for a violent ukrainization of the donbas so what so happened in this, so uh, the life of this 40 plus year old man uh, that he switched sides in 2022 he switched well he kind of switched sides in uh, oh, yeah, right? yes in 2019 i think he switched like parties and um but he remained uh, in Ukraine yes, and yes. served as a Ukrainian uh, politician, but a, a kind of a yes. vaguely pro-Russian one, right? Yes, he was the head of, well, he kind of, um, it's bizarre, like in 2017, he became the, the head of the Socialist Party of Ukraine. Mm. And in 2019, he joined um, the... Um, well, the Medvedchuk party, Opozere. And yeah, and uh, a month before the war, he uh, fled Ukraine and um, yeah, went to Russia and uh, became somewhat of a <clears throat> Kiev insider on Russian state TV. Yeah, I think the main difference between Russian politicians and Ukrainian politicians is that for Russian politicians, uh, their job is a uh, sinecure. It's not uh, that lucrative, but for Ukrainians, it's a very lucrative business and they switch sides uh, every single year if it's uh, financially gainful mm -hmm. for them. So that uh, explains the, their erratic uh, identity. Uh, because yeah, they they just uh, looking out for those who will pay more, and then they will sell them themselves easily. That that's their uh, strategy. And for yeah. Russians, it's like a pension thing, right? When you're mm -hmm. done with business or sports, and you just want to chill and support Putin <laughs> and not do anything yeah. else. So yeah. a very uh, different I, political if, environments. If I, if I remember correctly, uh, Kiva was also personal friends with um, Arsena Vakov. Uh huh. Yeah. All so right. yeah, li like act like an actual Ukrainian neo-Nazi war criminal who suddenly became a pro-Russian leftist, mm -hmm. and uh, then 
fled to Russia and uh, talked a bunch of bullshit on TV. Like, like he's a total. He was a total grifter, and uh, I, like I, I, I don't like the fact that he was even allowed to to come to Russia and to speak on Russian TV and so on. Um, so, well, yeah. the same fate as uh, Padalyaka, the guy who was very popular at the start of the special military operation as a blogger, uh, Yuri yeah. Padalyaka. I think he's kind of fizzled out or he's not as prominent as he used to be. But he also was a uh, uh, big uh, yeah, Bandera fan, actually. <laughs> so th those guys are... Uh, fluid in their identity mm -hmm. and they're m very financially motivated but uh, let's not speak too much ill of the dead yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe he crossed some roads that he shouldn't but it's a dangerous sport uh, being a ukrainian or a former ukrainian politician so yeah That's um, true. before we, we move uh, to new topics their exciting topics uh, i will read your messages that you sent us uh, let's see. The Anonymous. Anonymous sent us. This Friday is Daria Dugina's birthday. It seems rather poetic that it coincides with the US Congress's deadline to approve funding for Ukraine. Mm. Yeah, mm. well, uh, <laughs> I'm not following the US Congress so much. They, they are, uh, yeah, I'm uh, not either. It, it, it is, seems like mostly like internal American yeah. politics and theater. Yeah. It is a theater, but uh, regarding Daria Dugina, uh, for those who are unaware, we uh, recorded a big two hour interview with uh, Alexander Dugin, and it actually turned out great. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is that uh, we started this podcast <laughs> with an uh, episode on Galkovsky and we named it uh, Dmitry Galkovsky, the thinking man's Dugin, <laughs> which is pretty <laughs> offensive for Dugin. And uh, yeah, we were never big fans of Dugin, but I always enjoyed reading or watching him. And uh, I gotta say that my opinion of him... Um, was improved drastically over the last few years and especially after our interview because he's very sensible and this uh, uh, you know there, there is a stereotype of him in the west but there is also a lot of slander about uh, the man in russia as well and um, uh, yeah so there's no uh, any crazy outlandish ideas i think uh, it's not uh, true uh, about his beliefs and uh, yeah actually i really enjoyed our conversation and if you haven't already then check it out it's on youtube channel and the full, full version of it is on gumroad and patreon <clears throat> yes I, I agree actually uh, my uh, i've yeah my opinion on uh, alexander galevich has also greatly improved after actually talking to the man yeah uh he is a You're great victims of propaganda but yeah go <laughs> no uh, he's a great uh storyteller and conversationist so it was a really uh well just pleasant to oh. talk to him and a very erudite man like uh, i liked especially like when we started talking about gaza and he started like quoting a bunch of like uh the jewish literature that i have never Rabinic heard of texts yes yeah <laughs> uh yeah and uh, he has a very um unique trait that he's very young at heart actually because uh, the typical russian or not even russian but typical grandpa is very arrogant and very hard to talk to when he spots that you are much younger than him then it's over right there there will never be a proper conversation because he will try to teach you about life and uh <laughs> yeah and he will Chinook. presume that you <laughs> don't know anything and it's not the case with Dugin. He is very great with uh, people who are younger than him. He is not arrogant. And that uh, I really liked about him. So, yeah. 
this is good and next up anonymous sent us via donation alerts uh, according to ukrainian x twitter general teplinsky is forming white guard storm units consisting entirely of officers who have failed as commanders is this true or yet another ukrainian fake uh, i have not heard of that but um well, that doesn't sound too terrible, really. I mean, that's what uh, Wagner did as well. Um, when commanders uh, screwed up royally in really bad ways, then the commanders were simply sent uh, to the stormtrooper units. So I don't see anything wrong with that. But it's probably completely made up. But uh, yeah, if not, I don't think it's uh, really a terrible idea. Then they are learning from Wagner's best features, such as downgrading uh, officers yeah. or commanders. And uh, next message, Anonymous, uh, there recently was a conference hosted by Всемирный Русский Народный Собор. The ideological section was particularly fascinating with speeches by Dugin and Episcop Savva. Did you see it? Oh, I have not. I I was too busy yeah, me <laughs> <laughs> bringing my infant baby to a speedboat. I'm sorry, I'm such a degenerate. But uh, <laughs> I think, uh, and I'm not familiar with Episcop Sava either. But I will try to check it out. Thank you. An anonymous Kirill. The Western press writes that Ukrainian AD is stronger than ever because of NATO AD systems, like the Patriot, that have been delivered. Is that narrative bogus in your view? Well, considering that just in the last few days, uh, Kiev was hit twice with no um, visible air defenses being active and not even the air raid alarms going off until after the explosions. That does seem ridiculous. Uh, Ukrainian air defenses appear to be extremely degraded right now. And um, in Odessa, we see hits all the time and you just see random um, air defense guns blasting into the air and doing absolutely nothing. And um, so I don't think that uh, there really is a full layered air defense system in Ukraine anymore. I think they have just enough to for the front lines and uh, basically to prevent uh, Russian aviation from flying deeply into Ukrainian territory. Although we have seen uh, drones uh, do that, uh, for example. We have seen the large, unwieldy and easy to shoot down uh, or one drones uh, flying like 80 or 100 kilometers deep into Ukrainian territory. Mm. So, yeah, uh, from the looks of it, uh, Ukrainian air defenses are seriously degraded and uh, look barely strong enough for like the actual front lines and uh, probably not enough to um, defend against uh, uh, any large scale missile strike. Uh, this is what they are very worried about currently, because there have been no uh, large-scale missile strikes for a while. And uh, Russia is uh, very obviously stockpiling cruise missiles. And uh, the question is, what are they stockpiling them for? <laughs> and uh, this could be either, um, well, could be anything really uh, if... Uh, from what I hear Western experts say is that many believe that Russia is stockpiling these missiles to take out the uh, Ukrainian power grid for good this winter. But we'll see, I guess. Mm -hmm. In any case, I don't think that uh, the Ukrainians could do anything against a massive missile attack right now. And next message, how is the battle of Avdeevka going relative to your expectations? Are Russian losses overstated? And who states Russian losses actually? And what what is stated? I'm not sure. Um, 
Well, they are basically saying that, like, what, I think 30,000 or what Russian soldiers have died in Avdiivka, and, like, I don't know what, what the numbers they pull out of their ass, something like 500 more tanks. More than in Bakhmut, right? <laughs> yes, something like 500 tanks destroyed or whatever. Um, the problem is that, yes, losses are significant in Avdiivka, of course, because it's, uh, well, we're attacking... Uh, heavily fortified positions that will always incur losses and Russian forces have also to deal with minefields and uh, all the other shit that has stopped the Ukrainian counteroffensive. So attacking is still difficult. It, uh, it's not a walk in the park, most definitely. And losses are significant, but I have not really heard anything about catastrophic losses. Like it's, uh, I think the level of losses is to be expected from such an operation. Like, um, I don't think that there were any huge tactical mistakes that were made. And at least I haven't seen or heard anything like that. Uh, it's just that there will be losses if you attack uh, through uh, a million minefields into the most heavily fortified place on the planet. That, that uh, It's impossible to do that without losses, sadly. And uh, although I have been like uh, a team uh, tactical nuke uh, for a while now, especially uh, with regards to Ovdievka, but uh, I digress. Um, there's also that much of the photo, like there have been a lot of attacks on Ovdievka, a lot of probing attacks, a lot of attempted uh, like assaults um, all throughout the war, especially in the beginning. Like I think. The losses uh, we the Donetsk People's Militia took in the beginning of the war, when they just started attacking Avdiivka, were higher than uh, yes. uh, than the current losses because uh, that was really bad. Like in March and April uh, 2022, um, the uh, that was a real meat grinder, and uh, I think that was really worse than what's happening now. And so you get a lot of footage of uh, like um, Russian vehicles or Russian wrecks. Uh, well, some of the wrecks are like from last year and uh, they just haven't been moved. And uh, like if you, for example, if the Ukrainians do another offensive in around Kabotina, you're going to have the same problem where it will be very hard to see if uh, these are actually new losses or old losses. And, uh, of course, it's in the interest of the Ukrainian side to uh, overstate Russian losses. So, basically, every every single burnt-out uh, BTR that uh, could be from, like, ma from like 20 months ago um, is being presented as a new loss during the current offensive. Yes. Well, of course, there are necessary losses at every uh, assault uh, or even defense but uh, they were also higher than they had to be in the beginning of this new phase of of df cooperation and uh, but uh, now and uh, i am not really following anything uh, too closely right now but um uh, so <laughs> it's only anecdotally right and anecdotally bakhmut was probably the uh, most costly operation because i've actually heard of uh, yeah. people dying who i know or i've heard about in my city so this is the way that you actually feel the losses and you can't really escape it you hear uh, about it from your friends relatives or colleagues it's inevitable and about avdiivka i haven't heard much so yeah that's true okay uh, so and next up, Anonymous, uh, what infrastructure projects will Russia focus on next? Uh, uh, now that uh, they are key members of BRICS+, Plus, what infrastructure projects is Russia most in need of? Is high-speed rail in its future? So there are three questions, and we will try to answer it. And... Uh, high speed rails <laughs> so yeah uh, that's a funny one because uh, the russian government promised high speed rails for quite 
a while now. The problem I mean, they are, is, they yeah. are building the line between Moscow and Saint Petersburg right now. I think. Well, it's, it's already like, pretty high speed, isn't it? Yeah, it's already uh, pretty. And it's limited to Moscow, Saint Pe Saint Petersburg because those yeah. are the biggest uh, agglomerations of people. Mm. But um, the problem is, of course, the enormous length of the railroad yeah. system in russia yeah. unlike spain or whatnot although we are lacking in this department still it's uh, if you look at the map of the speed uh, average speed of the trains or high speed railroads uh, in europe and russia now well, it's pretty miserable let's <laughs> say in russia <laughs> but it's very hard to do as well and yeah. uh, uh, for example, yeah, they promised like five years ago that they will uh, build a high-speed railroad uh, from Moscow to Ekaterinburg uh, via Nizhny Novgorod and uh, Kazan. And they decided to make a, a highway instead for cars and they completely dropped this project. So I don't think that high-speed railroads uh, uh, aside from Moscow, St. Petersburg area, are <laughs> coming to Russia anytime soon, un unfortunately. So, yeah, uh, infrastructure projects, uh, mainly it's about buildings and, uh, and building, rebuilding the destroyed areas. Uh, we have already talked about Mariupol, and you probably know about, but uh, there is... Uh, I think I, I have seen some new projects for a different city other than Mariupol, a liberated city, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, a friend of mine has relatives in Severodonetsk, and he said they are building there a lot as well, uh, new apartment buildings, and even uh, hmm. they are renovating the old uh, playgrounds, the children's playgrounds, which had been built in the Brezhnev period and not touched since. And so they are all being brought up to Moscow hipster urbanist uh, yeah. standards. There is a great construction boom all over Russia. And uh, it's the main thing that's actually going on because the Soviet legacy of comic blocks is great and all, but <laughs> it's so vast and it's, it needs to be renovated or destroyed, frankly. And that's what... Uh, is happening right now and yeah um, but now that we are key members of BRICS uh, I, I, yeah I mean I guess we're gonna build a lot of nuclear power stations in BRICS well countries. yeah like, that's, that's pretty what, unique yeah. that's what Rosatom is very good at and I think we are like the best in the world at that actually right now so yeah haven't we built a a uh, nuclear power station in Turkey. Uh, yes, I think so. Like a year ago, or I yeah. think so. Yes. Yeah. So, two those two directions, we will say. So, okay, Amy sent us. Uh, please explain the Russian election process. Yeah, <laughs> we wanted to talk about <laughs> it because it's very exciting. The it's 2024 <laughs> election. In Russia. It's, it, it's it's so funny how like, like foreigners are like actually interested in the election and stuff. They were trained by democracy. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah, but... No, but okay. On a serious note, um, we are not gonna get into formal stuff because that is, is yeah, I would simply die of boredom. But like overall, the election campaign, the campaign period will. Be very um, calm. Uneventful. <laughs> very, very uneventful because um, there is a single candidate. It's uh, Vladimir Putin. But no, I, yes. I'm wrong. There are also such people as Boris Nadezhdin and uh, uh, a fellow named Rabinovich. And uh, <laughs> that's it. And, and Strelkov. And Strelkov, who is now <laughs> imprisoned. So yes. a, a tough so crowd, <laughs> a tough competition. So yeah. basically the process will be that most of the Russian electorate will as usually unite in their desire to vote for Vladimir Putin. But Putin will also not conduct an active election campaign because he is dealing with the special military operation. And the other candidates will most likely also not conduct election campaigns. 
so as not to interfere with Putin dealing with the special military operations. And voters uh, want Putin not to do an election campaign, but to focus on the special military operation. And as such, there will be an agreement among the authorities, the electorate and all candidates that uh, the election campaign should not be too vigorous because uh, we have more important things going on. And as such, there will not be a lot of political scandal, not a lot of propaganda or whatever. It will just be a very calm thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there were even suggestions to drop uh, the elections altogether. Yeah, but that's uh, but not Putin going declined. to happen. In, yeah, in, yeah that, that's not going to happen in the capital of legal autism. Um, yeah. Putin will not suspend elections uh, in an, any way that could be... Uh, this is... Uh, Weird, unnecessary bureaucratic processes are sacred to Vladimir Putin and uh, as such, yeah, everything will be done by the book and according to the law. But I haven't actually uh, finished uh, the donation from Amy. Do you oh. vote uh, to select the governor of your of your regions? And that's an interesting question. So it's uh, selective, Not right? The... Uh, we used to uh, vote for governors. All yeah. regions used to do yeah. that. But some regions, uh, uh, now I think it's like uh, five. So I would uh, speak for my region, so Sverdlovsk Oblast. Uh, we used to do that until 2016 or, or somewhere thereabouts. And uh, since then we are now, uh, we, <laughs> we don't have this right anymore. And we do not for, uh, vote for governors. Although this right is still reserved in some regions, I think it's mo most of Siberia votes for governors. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting structure and uh, yeah, it's very federal. So some do and some don't. And uh, yeah, and it's, uh, people are not really happy about it, but uh, then, then again, the internal politics are so dead that no one really cares because... Uh, <laughs> It's very cynical and it's... Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's... You know, a, yeah, it's like... It, it, you, yeah, okay, go ahead. It's a double-edged sword, the, the electing governors thing, because on one hand, uh, yes, you get someone with actual connection to the region uh, yeah. and who is not just an appointee by Moscow. But on the other hand, that also opens the door to more corruption and clans and like what you had going on uh, oh, but he, he's not a governor, he, yeah. Yeah, but I didn't mean that. I mean that, uh, God, well, 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 what was their name? You know, that criminal gang in Tambov that had ties to the governor and so on, and the whole yeah. MVD and all that stuff. And you get less of that if you have like a, a Variak from Moscow, some mm -hmm. technocrat. Yeah, uh, so the, the state of democracy really in Ukraine and Russia is similar. The only difference is that um, Ukrainians are trying to entertain yes, this. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it goes on while Russians are disenchanted. But it, it doesn't do any favors for Ukrainians, as you can clearly see. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's good to be out of the circus when it's not working <laughs> at all. Uh, and the, <laughs> Yeah, but there are other questions from Amy. Or do you directly vote for a presidential candidate? Yeah, we do vote for a presidential candidate and um, um, for mayors. So some regions vote for mayors and uh, governors and some don't for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, but uh, there's no difference really. Uh, and in your opinion, any chance that Putin would lose? Not uh, on, the only chance that Putin would lose if he doesn't run, but he is already running. So there is no chance. It, it's it's up to him really if he's uh, down to actually retire. But I, I don't think it's the right moment. And the funniest thing is that people are pretty happy with Putin. Now, especially now, uh, it's kind of like Roosevelt, right? During the uh, war in America, then people uh, were happy with Roosevelt for the third term, but it's not the third term, uh, but uh, what, what is it? Uh, the, the fourth term for Putin, yeah. yes. 
And also, you know, like the old uh, Russian proverb, коней на переправе не меняют, you don't switch horses uh, on a crossing. Yeah. So, probably not much in the democracy department for our <laughs> listeners, but it is what it is. We try to be honest because we are not paid by the Russian government to present some bullshit picture. So, be happy with that. All right. Um, Thank you, Siobhan. Uh, great news about Twitter X. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so we already tackled the presidential race, but we will actually uh, we'll follow it because e uh, the elections will happen uh, mar on March uh, 24. Uh, actually, the same year that Biden will or will not be re-elected, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, we are in sync. But uh, uh, guys, are you happy that uh, you, if any Americans are actually watching us because it's very early for them uh, still <laughs> and they're actually uh, working right now, but still, are you happy that you can vote for Biden or vote for, who is it, R RFK? Uh, is it st uh, really, uh, really uh, exciting for you guys? Do you really believe in that? Because I don't think so. I don't think that you do. And uh, yeah, I haven't really followed uh, American elections as well. Are there any candidates other than RFK? Is Trump a candidate? Do you know? Uh, he intends to run, yeah. I mean, I haven't followed the process, uh, but... But he's, I... he's kind of in a Strelkov situation, <laughs> almost behind bars, right? So we're yeah. really similar. It's just that the Americans <laughs> are willing to entertain the circus, and we actually don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Um, Anonymous, I see that uh, the Taliban's public relations department has an account on X. Should we spam it with uh, Vivat Shuravi? Long live the Soviets by Kaskat. <laughs> I don't actually think that the account is real, but it's a funny account, yes. Mm. Does it have a blue check? It's the only uh, way to know. <laughs> uh, let me check, I'm not sure. And while Kirill is checking, I will explain what you're watching <laughs> this whole live stream on the screen. So I uh, took some uh so, some fragments of the new trendy russian tv show but it's not tv show it's a, it's an internet original like hbo or netflix but russian start original uh slova pacana and we will also talk about it because it's a big cultural phenomenon you know and uh, yeah it's about uh, youth gangs in the kazan in the during the perestroika time so, yeah, and I yeah, watched and, uh, four episodes of it. Yeah, go ahead. And yes, the Taliban PR department account does have a blue check, but it, uh, the original one was suspended, actually, and this is a new one. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's a very funny account, but I don't think it is uh, actually run by the Taliban. And um, yeah, I will read next message from Anonymous. Putin ordered every Russian couple to have eight kids. What is your plan to fulfill your duty? Did he actually order it? I'm not sure. <laughs> Does he himself have uh, eight kids? Maybe Who knows? Out of <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, so, uh, what is my plan? I, I think uh, three kids is enough uh, myself, but uh, we will see about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we are we are uh, planning for three as well. So yeah, I think that's it's a good typical. Uh, but uh, the rural Russians actually do it and do it very fast, in my experience. And mm. <laughs> while the urban Russians are planning <laughs> forever. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, so yeah, uh, about the kids, uh, th there is an interesting thing: uh, internal Russian use about abortions. So. Liberals in, inside Russia, and there are liberals inside Russia, and feminist activists and whatnot, um, they are scared that Russian government intends to uh, criminalize abortion. And uh, although it's not publicly stated as such that Kremlin decides, uh, decided to 
completely ban abortions but they believe that it is the case and there is a an interesting well it's not interesting but a funny article from a foreign agent media source medusa about this matter so i will quote some of it it seems increasingly that the kremlin has decided to completely ban abortions in russia uh, in the autumn of 23 2023 the russian authorities launched a large scale campaign to restrict the right to abortion in five regions at once lipetsk chelyabinsk kursk and tatarstan and mordovia private clinics completely or partially refu started refusing abortions and they did it allegedly voluntarily and uh, the same thing happened in crimea and sevastopol Mm -hmm. that they said uh, the ukrainian territories great russian media source <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, and uh, it goes on and on that there are some inside information from the russian government that they the complete madmen actually want to do it want to ban abortion altogether and it's just the early steps the the private clinic uh, uh, refusing their clients and uh, mm, it's actually it's uh, it's I, I not opposed to that of course but um, it's more complicated than that because most abortions in Russia are not done by private clinics yeah um, most abo uh, abortions are free in Russia as part of public health care at yeah. government hospitals and uh, if I remember the stats correctly uh, only around 25 percent of uh, abortions in russia are done at private clinics so... yeah it's a small drop right and uh, private clinics uh, they cost like twenty thousand rubles and in a state clinic it costs zero so it's not that big of a deal because uh, there are still plenty of abortions free abortions going on in russia and considering that uh, well, it's funny how I actually know one girl who is my distant relative who uh, is a feminist and she went on a, a sort of uh, protest in the local park against the <laughs> ban mm -hmm. on abortions that uh, mm -hmm. is not actually happening. There is no ban on abortions and there is no public information about it. The only thing that the government wants to do is to uh, restrict uh, uh, free state abortions, uh, free state clinic abortions, or at least inform the the uh, women that it's not uh, an okay thing to do, uh, and uh, like show them some movies or something before they decide. So it's not actually a ban on abortions yet. Uh, it's uh, some steps to restrict uh, or uh, possibly lower the number of abortions uh, via various means uh, but still yeah um, a, a lot of people well feminists or uh, uh, people this ilk are outraged that uh, uh, the abortions will be banned and considering that in europe like poland or ireland uh, they are pretty much banned for most of the cases uh, well uh, and considering that Russia is still the, the world's leader in abortions uh, something needs to be done about it for sure yeah absolutely it's a uh, it's a big problem it's, that it's, Russians it's very, are not taken seriously uh, I mean yes I mean abortions have been going down every single year I think since 1991 yeah uh, they actually had their peak in uh, the 60s or the 70s mm -hmm. um, in, in, in Soviet times. and uh, But yeah, it's still very bad. It's still very high, the rate. Um, it, the dynamic is, of course, good because it's really like a steady decline every single year. But um, it's still way too high for a civilized country, I believe. And I did actually some uh, calculations and... Uh, uh, pure, like purely in uh, well utilitarian terms. Um, uh, let me see where I counted that. Uh, 
Uh, I can't find it, but I remember the numbers. Um, basically, I, I counted uh, based on the abortion stats um, that uh, between basically between 1993 and 2005, um, Three million uh, male babies were aborted, and uh, so six million overall. And uh, the that's real basically the... okay. <laughs> Let's not get into that. But and, yeah, that's, go ahead. and that's and that's well, that's three million men who would be between eighteen and thirty now, and who are sorely lacking in Russia right now, and uh, like uh, from a. Purely utilitarian point of view, taking Avdeevka wouldn't take so long if we had three million more military-aged men. Yeah. So, yeah, the Soviet praxis of abortion as the main uh, way of contraception is simply atrocious. It, it's the worst uh, crime, yeah, probably, it, that the Soviets did. And um, uh, just ignoring it. Uh, and many during, Russians are already during, complacent. And, uh, yeah. and if you look at the numbers, it's like pure horror. It's like... Um, during Soviet times, um, the equivalent of the current population of Russia was aborted. Yeah. Like basically all of the population, like the population would be double without oh, the Soviet uh, abortion uh, regime. At least the re uh, you got to see uh, see that um, the Soviet Union actually lacked uh, condoms. So the, of course there were condoms, but no one used them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, uh, the abortion was uh, the main way of contraception yeah, yeah. Which, uh, and some women uh, had like up to five or six or seven abortions in their lifespan and uh, it was uh, completely normalized uh, 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 where, um, uh, it's not the same thing in the west actually there is a big abortion debate in the US but still people recognize that it's a murder or uh, a lot of people do right in Russia I, would, I wouldn't say that it is the case many women especially think it's their right and it's like yeah. inalienable right to kill the babies and it, it, the opposition is strictly uh, People, religious people, Orthodox people, and so that's pretty much it. Yeah, uh, that's it. That's it. The church is like the only anti-abortion lobbying organization in Russia. There is and, nothing else. Yeah, and there are not that many actual devout Orthodox Christians in Russia, unfortunately. So it's a very one-sided debate, and there, yeah. there there needs to be a, yeah direct intervention from the government because um, if it was a democratic issue. Russians would actually vote for free abortions and uh, to yeah uh, yeah so uh, it's a very black uh, topic to thing to talk about actually I don't particularly enjoy uh, thinking all right about let's it change much. it but uh, <laughs> still it is what it is so um, and there is a funny donation I will skip the line and <laughs> read it Sasha is Pate Colony низкий поклон вам пацаны отлично базарите видно что не шпаны не козлы, не во флеры. Дай бог, чтобы у вас все фортануло. Автомат и пистолет, мусоров здесь близко нет. Пацан, не чушпан. От души, от души. Uh, yeah, we will uh, switch uh, soon enough to the слово пацана topic, because mm -hmm. it's a very big one. Yeah, uh, so Сеопхан sent us. Вообще-то это Шивон. So I'm I'm misspelling the username. It's not Siobhan, it's Shivon. Uh, Shivon в гельском гельском ирландском звучит так же как кириллическая буква В. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Спасибо, Shivon. <laughs> Ivan the Plumber. If the recent flooding, collapse of cell phone networks, etc., turning Kiev into a progressively unlivable city. Uh, what effect will this have on Ukraine's ability to wage war? So we already kind of did oh, that actually, last yes, year. Yes, yeah. yes, I, I wanted actually to mention that because it's completely insane, actually. Uh, okay. Like, uh, I mean, it's probably common knowledge that the country of Ukraine has not managed to build a single subway station since the revolution of dignity in 2013. Yeah. 
and that they also haven't managed to start working on the subway network in Donetsk for since they re received independence, because all the plans were actually ready, like they were about to start construction in 1991. Um, but anyway, uh, so recently it has uh, come to, well, it has become undeniable that the subway system in Kiev has not been maintained basically at all for decades. And the city authorities simply stole all the money that was to go to maintenance, scheduled repairs, and so on. And uh, now the whole subway system in Kiev may just collapse on itself. Like there are already flooded stations. There are already stations that can't be used and all without any input from the Russian aerospace forces. It's uh, uh, just, well, Ukrainian independence. I mean, the like I said before, the average small town in Ukraine or mid-sized town in Ukraine already looked like it was carpet bombed before the war even started. And uh, now a huge city's complete subway system may literally just fall apart. Like, how insane is that? Well, <laughs> do you know the blogger uh, Ukrainian blogger Super Sus, who used to actually lurk in those uh, tunnels, su uh, subway tunnels, and do all kind of crazy uh, shit in, in those tunnels. No, I don't. No, I don't think I've uh, heard of him. Yeah, but uh, there is something to his vision, I think, uh, because uh, if actually uh, he visited all those abandoned stations mm -hmm. and whatnot, and uh, as they say, um, yeah, uh, the wheel, <clears throat> uh, the uh, how is it? Uh, yeah, the 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 arc uh, of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards the vindication of super sus in Ukraine, <laughs> in a way. But yeah, uh, okay, let's uh, move on to the next message and um, then we will have uh, a few more topics uh, the the crime series about youth gangs and uh, and something else yeah uh, that i have written down in my notepad so yeah anonymous sent us if they ban abortions they should force the fathers to pay alimony if you're they already do that they already do that. Yeah. If you're able to fuck, you're able to raise a kid down with liberal <laughs> responsibility. But yeah, there is alimony. And yeah, there is a relevant uh, news item, but it's not actually a news item. It's just a, a speech by, Limo, uh, by Milonov on the, some radio show. But uh, the Russian news channels ran with that. So uh, Milonov is uh well wh who is he uh, he's a deputy right he's a famous russian mm -hmm. deputy who was instrumental in outlawing uh lgbt propaganda in russia almost a decade ago uh, so yeah and uh, recently he said that uh, he would also criminalize uh, the child free movement and uh <laughs> Uh, for some reason, his uh, it's it's not an actual uh, law or anything. It's just uh, saying uh, what Milonov said on the radio. But still, so uh, Milonov said that all men who adhere to this movement uh, should be declared as homosexuals. And uh, <laughs> although it's a valiant effort, but I'm not sure is there actually a child-free movement, or is it is it a meme? Because I, think mm, really... I mean, I, like there is like, uh, I don't know if it's, if you can actually call it a movement. It's like but... an online ideology. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. But uh, yeah. But in what's uh, j j just one of those millennial lip things. Yeah. It's not that major one, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I agree with Milonov preemptively and um, Right. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, one thing we forgot to mention is that uh, 
the Supreme Court of Russia has now officially uh, declared the LGBT movement an extremist movement. Mm. So the LGBT movement is now on the list of uh, extremist uh, extremist movements in Russia, uh, which uh, is uh, usually I'd be against, uh, you know, such a broad law because it basically allows one to um ban and imprison anyone with a rainbow flag it's a very broad and sweeping law but on the other hand in this particular case and especially in the situation russia is in now it's basically i mean um the lgbt movement in any country in the world is basically the american diaspora and um so yeah I think uh, that is a correct move in that sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really glad that uh, the LGBT debates are in the past, because uh, like 10 years ago, there were serious attempts by them to hold a pride parade in Moscow, and they were beaten bloody by some skinheads, or was it 15 years ago? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but, uh, like you said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards uh, Vitaly Milonov being vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, now people are not flirting into those ideas, and uh, better yet, they don't find them uh, appealing. So uh, there are bad, bad traits that Russians have learned, such as uh, complete compl complacency and uh, approval of abortions. But... Uh, Luckily, Russians do not approve of LGBT at all. And uh, there are really no people who do that, uh, aside from like 1% uh, of Zoomer extremists online. So, yeah. yeah, and that's a good thing. All right. And uh, it's really great to not have a Pride month, right? Once a year. <laughs> it's something <laughs> that we should treasure more because yeah, some people are... True living in a completely different environments um oh i'm just seeing by the way news uh, apparently iran has abolished all visa requirements for a bunch of countries including russia hmm. we should do an rwa tour to tehran or something and make well, our, yeah they our were on, the, for it. on their way to to do it actually a while ago and they actually want to visit to uh, Iran. Yeah, me too. I, I, I would love, I would love to uh, visit Iran. Iran. I, Should we do that? I actually thought about buying an Iranian car some mm. time ago. So, so I don't remember the name of it, but there are some Iranian cars, Iranian-made cars, brands uh, that are being sold in Russia. Not new ones, like uh, budget mm. ones from the like the nineties, but they're pretty good. I think they're knockoffs of. Uh, like Peugeot or Renault or something like that. But yeah, it, it would be pretty unique to have an Iranian whip, I would say. <laughs> and um, while, uh, so yeah, you are free to congratulate, uh, congratulate us on 300,000 people, subscribers on Twitter and send us a message or question that we will answer and read aloud. And in the meantime, uh, let's uh, talk a bit about this new uh, series because the moment that I stepped on the Russian soil uh, from returning from my flight, uh, <laughs> I have immediately spotted that there is uh, this uh, huge trend going on about the the new uh, incredibly famous uh, and popular popular series Slova Pacana. And how would you translate? Slovo Pacana in English. Mm, how would you translate Pacan? Um, yeah. It's not a boy. It's not really mm, a proper translation. No, it's like, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, I think conceptually, like purely conceptually, the closest thing would be like a like, uh, real one. A real one. It's a real mm. one. But, the um, word of a real one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, the other thing that I felt 
uh, when I stepped on the Russian soil again is that it's uh, it was a minus 32 centigrade <laughs> the slow pacana the two <laughs> things so uh, everyone is watching it it's huge it's about uh, youth gangs of uh, late 80s prehistoric era Kazan which is actually pretty uh, interesting because uh, typically Russian TV shows or films avoid regional things uh, uh, avoid filming in some city other than Moscow right or yeah, that, that, that. naming naming the city other than Moscow because it's impolite if the film is bad right yeah. or, or it's about some gruesome topics uh, they would insult the city and they just I mean, uh, follow this tradition kind of, of uh, yeah uh, and yeah. um yes, yes. and, and so stuff like that from russian yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, from the russian literature but it's wrong because uh, this way you don't popularize your culture your history and your cities right across russia and uh, this time around they were not shy in actually uh showing 80s Kazan and uh, so it's about a 14 year old boy who stepped away from the straight and narrow and joined a local gang uh, Gopnik violence, family scandals and, and the Patsanska Romantica ensues so I watched uh, four episodes of it and it's pretty damn good it's uh, very thorough in the recreation of the jargon of the slang of the uh how they were dressed those uh, uh late soviet gopniks and how then they will transform into actual adult gangs in the 90s so uh, but uh, yeah we're a bit stuck in perestroika times it seems that r russian movie directors can stop making uh, films about perestroika and its conse uh, consequences and uh, constantly uh, touching this old wound and assessing the damage and uh, trying to capitalize from nostalgia of course and uh, if we would compare this series Slova Pacana to another great series that we have already recommended uh, namely Mir Druz Bozhevachka uh, that uh, dealt with 90s school children being surrounded by gang wars and general degradation of the country then this new series is way more uh, way darker more brooding and cynical it's uh, in a way uh, it juxtaposes the pioneer romanticism at the de backdrop of a country that is going over and uh, the, no one believes anything anymore and um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah it's about this nihilism that uh, overtook the uh, USSR and uh, yeah it's pretty good I won't comment much on it uh, go watch it but it's paywalled it's uh, available on the Russian services uh, TV uh, such as Wink and, uh, and Root Start. Tracker and Root Tracker <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah so <laughs> <laughs> So try Root Tracker if you don't uh, want to pay uh, 300 rubles a month. Yeah, um, yeah. I, have, I haven't watched it yet. I am planning to. And we will do a proper I... review then, right? Yes. Yes. Apparently there is a big scandal in um, Ukraine because apparently the show is extremely popular in Ukraine as well. Sure. And like the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture officially stated that like watching it is bad and you shouldn't watch it and stuff like that. There are elements of a very smart, um, not propaganda, but still. Uh, so one of the main characters is a uh, young hoodlum, and he has an older brother who re has recently returned from the Afghan war. He's a veteran. Uh, who sports mustaches and uh, this uh, veteran comes up to his younger bro and uh, he spots that he's wearing um, a baseball cap with USA written on it mm -hmm. and he immediately mm -hmm. says uh, like uh, those busters supplied uh, stingers to to uh, Afghan uh, Afghanis uh, mm -hmm. So you shouldn't wear it because, uh, yeah, uh, those are our enemies. And yeah, 
but it's very well woven and i think uh, it's probably the case that uh, the afghan war vets were pretty angry at the americans because they actually spotted a lot of american tech uh, there and it's a start of this proxy war with us mm -hmm. the the hot war right that many russians uh, i mean we did the same thing hand. in vietnam I mean, yeah. we did the same thing in Vietnam. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so it's, it is very hypocritical to be mad about uh, Afghanistan, actually. <laughs> well, not mad, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, when uh, yeah, your I get it. <laughs> friends are dying because of the American yeah, sure. weaponry, you are mad. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, hypocrisy. Yeah. yeah. I so, actually find it uh, yeah. interesting that the show is apparently so popular in Ukraine, yeah. uh, despite, like, uh, the... Uh, of course, uh, whipped up anti-Russian hysteria, but I think it, it is kind of an indictment um, because it turns out that the actual culture that Russians and Ukrainians still share, in a way, is like not the culture of Pushkin or whatever, yeah. but but it's uh, like uh, street culture. Urban, yeah, yeah, it's urban uh, uh, urban street crime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, because uh, basically we uh, also lost uh, a lot of connection to our higher culture yeah, during course. the perestroika in the 90s, but uh, we kind of tried to resurrect it uh, and uh, we're actually doing it right now, whereas Ukrainians have completely lost touch with the higher culture of their ancestors, but um, of course, the street violence and the gangs are all dear to Ukrainian hearts. Yeah, as well. and I think it's also it's also because they still have a lot more of that because yeah. they are, as we always say, Ukraine is kind of stuck in the nineties. Um, it's basically a country where the nineties never ended, and as such, uh, whereas such a show is mostly just nostalgia for the Russian viewers, um, it is more so like relatable for for ukrainian viewers because yeah. it is much closer to their reality than to ours right now and besides ukrainian uh, there's there are no uh, regional series coming out from ukraine and it's not because of the war the most surprising thing is that ukrainians really didn't uh, uh, film any anything serious D didn't uh, they there are no good Ukrainian movies or TV series that yeah, are not true. that are not comedic. There are some. True, uh, yeah. There is a lot of comedy coming out of Ukraine. The Zelensky, the Swati, and uh, what mm -hmm. Quartal Dionysta Piat, but nothing serious. No dramas. Nothing. Uh, nothing. Although they had this great uh, Odessa film studio and uh, yeah uh, in kiev as well they have a, lo a lot of equipment and experience from the soviet times and they lost it just like the subway system in kiev so yeah uh, they have really if the ukrainian uh, people want to uh, watch something not uh, war related not some great analytical blog by aristovich <laughs> or whoever <laughs> then they must uh, they they have no other choice than watch uh, russian things yeah and they do just that so and another thing that i noticed upon my return to russia is that um i i kind of miss that russia is really an extreme country because well <laughs> the extreme weather kind of helped me realize that because uh well russians often lamenting are well as we did earlier right are comparatively a small population and all those lost uh, during the soviet times and the abortions and the uh, gulags and whatnot and uh, russians often say that we would be uh, like a 500 million nation if it wasn't for all these uh, tragic events and i did it myself but clearly it's a bit of a fantasy because we are still the biggest country in Europe right now, you know, with a population of uh, 150 million people. And it is by itself pretty mind-blowing, because there are no, simply no other countries that have a similar climate. And uh, like, what, what are they? Canada and Kazakhstan are much less populated, even going by people per square kilometer. And uh, 
uh, it's just uh, there are no countries uh, that are big and uh, have large urban areas and have more than a hundred million people in them uh, and uh, the temperature can drop to minus 37 or 40. I mean, <laughs> I mean the United States, I guess. Well, they yeah, do, some they areas, also have like yeah. they also have like all the climate stuff that's all the same mm -hmm. from Arctic to tropical. Sure, they do. But uh, how many people in US live in those extremely cold areas like Alaska or what? What is it, Nebraska, and uh, other yeah. places like? a couple of million people and yeah, uh, there uh, yeah there is uh, at least a hundred million people in russia that suffers uh, extreme cold in in during the mm. winter uh, because in moscow it also can drop to minus 30 and uh, aside from oh. the little strip, although yeah. although in my personal experience uh the russian cold is easier to bear than the like uh, central or western european cold mm. because it's uh, drier it's a dry sort of cold it's very dry and yeah. and, and it uh, like uh, if you're in like i don't know uh, the netherlands france or germany then minus 10 uh, feels like m makes you want to die simply because it's wet and it cuts right into your bones the cold mm -hmm. whereas in russia i mean i think the coldest i've personally experienced uh, in russia was like minus 28 i think and that's honestly didn't that's feel as bad and that re <laughs> well i've i've never been much east of moscow <laughs> uh, but honestly that's like um it doesn't feel as bad as the wet cold in uh, the more western parts of europe mm. Well, yeah, or Saint Petersburg, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. Well, the, uh, it's not that I was scared upon arrival that it was <laughs> minus thirty-two. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you came uh, from the heat, from extreme heat. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I wasn't uh, well dressed <laughs> because I didn't bring my uh, puchavik with me. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but um, it is extreme that we have uh, such large cities in Siberia or in the yeah. Urals and uh, to the, because yeah and i just looked at ekaterinburg at how large it is and how well developed it is considering that it was uh, like two for two weeks now it was uh, close to minus 40 at night <laughs> well now I it's mean, now it's a little bit better but still people it's live in people live in Nairsk, like, mm -hmm. like if you that's and not a small insane. number of people that's actually insane if you consider that hundreds of thousands of people permanently live in Nairsk. Like, what the yeah. fuck? Who and does it must that? develop a certain unique spirit and, uh, you know, uh, attitude and personality traits, uh, which are unique to this world. Because, yeah. Uh, so, uh, kind of, uh, when you don't get out much uh, from russia you just see it as normal but <laughs> after yeah. realizing that most of the world uh, lives in some well uh, in the heat uh, in the extreme heat uh, from the russian point of view you kind of reassess things and yeah so yeah okay uh, let's uh, read some messages uh, that they haven't yet Amy, elections created uh, vulnerability, meaning Ukraine will increase behind the lines attack. Kerch Bridge, another BSF vessel, sent drones and use it as a narrative against Putin to make him look weak. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't really matter if Ukrainians managed to do that, although they haven't really did that in many months. Uh, and there are no glaring fuck-ups fuck uh, from the Russian yeah. side for months as well. And yeah. there is no other candidate other than Putin. And uh, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. Um, from Yeah, I mean, any attack like against like uh, during the election is just going to be like... Uh, uh, like the Kremlin is just going to say they are attacking our democracy. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, it usually works the other way around. Like then, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
9/11. They hate us. Text. They hate. They hate us for our freedom. Yeah. And uh, okay, and anonymous. Uh, one of the consequences of the rise of the Slova Pacana is the popularity of the Tatar song Piala. It's a beautiful song, a beautiful language, and I'm glad that it's one uh, that lives within our borders. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the Tatar song Piala was that big before the series. Uh, oh, uh, you, you mean the consequences? Uh, well, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty good song, yeah. Uh, I can actually play it maybe soon, but uh, in the meantime, you are free to ask us anything. And um, actually, most of the topics that I've prepared or that you have asked us, uh, I think we thoroughly discussed all of them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I had I had something like 15 minutes okay. ago. I thought of a topic, but I forgot it again. Maybe I will remember. I will. Try. You really? I sold. will go. Yes. I yes. I am really getting old. I will be AFK for a sec, and uh, hopefully, I will remember the topic by okay. the time I get back. All right, so uh, let's play this song then. Uh, not video clip, just song. Uh, Piala, which is uh, a main soundtrack uh, in Tatran language um, for this uh, series. Slova Pacana. Okay, enjoy for two minutes. It's not a full song, but you get uh, the gist of it. And it's, yeah, it's a very smart, interesting uh, song. Uh, I, although I haven't really understood a word of it, but uh, <laughs> it sounds very good. <laughs> it sounds very good, and it's great that uh, they have this um, actual, pop, uh, actually popular, diverse music inside Russia. But uh, have you remembered the topic that you? Sadly, to I have not. Sadly, I have not. I am trying to remember. That's incredible. Was, but but uh, yeah. yeah, we can talk about something else. And uh, yeah, continue. I need to go. I, I need to go on vacation as well. Again. Yeah, you, you do. You do. Uh, is it cold right now? Uh, not you? very. It was cold uh, like the week before last, and. Uh, it's snow and stuff, but it's uh, like that annoying, uh, slightly above freezing and rain all the time. Uh, it's like the worst weather in the world. I would much rather have mountains of snow and minus 20 than this. It's really depressing. 
Mm-hmm. Like, like I haven't seen the sun in like two weeks. Yeah, but it's all about Marosa Sonse right yes, now. Yes. So it, it's pretty great. It looks great, but uh, the only problem is that you can't really walk too much. And uh, yeah, uh, the g- gyms in Russia are an absolute necessity because you are not motivated to do anything but sit at your home. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are uh, very um, the the development of those delivery services is also spoiling Russians, and I'm, I'm afraid that mm-hmm. in 20 years from now Russians will all be fat, disgusting <laughs> obese, because uh, mm. uh, uh, delivery is very cheap, and taxi compared to compared to uh, other countries is also mm-hmm. cheap. So yeah. Right. Uh, any, any more donations left? the classical question no <laughs> <laughs> okay Not well yet. then uh, uh well i think uh, we're done with topics so far i think maybe we should wrap it up we've been at it for almost two hours again again i have no idea how like professional streamers uh, do the stuff where they like stream all day like w- what could you possibly do they're just do. better at baiting their audience uh, uh, for like donations an eight stream. And, i mean uh, it would it, it would probably work better if we had our cameras on hmm probably well i guess donate if you want to see us <laughs> <laughs> at least a uh, hundred dollars will do <laughs> maybe uh, but yeah um per subscriber Let's uh, see. I think, yeah, I also had some other thoughts. Um, let's see about that. Um, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yes, I remember oh. what I wanted to say. Ha, ah, actually. Uh, what's about movies? Um, when you said that, uh, like, the Ukrainians have squander their uh, kino inheritance just like mm-hmm. they did everything else i think we did that too i i mean R- russian cinema is not in the best place i believe but, uh, there are some bangers coming out in recent years uh, but really not that much uh, i think uh, le- like just on the level of like professionalism i think the russian uh, cinema industry is still behind its uh, soviet ancestors well, yeah, uh, it is true, but uh, I was a big believer in Russian cinema for quite a while now. When it was trendy to shit on it, uh, I mm-hmm. saw that the trend was changing. And uh, the best thing that Russian cinema industry has done, has achieved, is to create uh, local versions of Netflix, HBO. It's not a copy, cat in uh, but yeah, yeah. our own... Uh, how is it called? Uh, aggregators or uh, platforms. Platforms that are funded by the actual viewers who pay for monthly subs- uh, subscriptions. So they do not depend on the state budget uh, of the cultural ministry anymore. And that's a great thing. Yeah, and not that's uh, some true. oligarchs. And they can provide content that uh, the viewers. Uh, desire for any taste and now of course it's a stream of uh, various uh, weird low budget series as well about prostitution in Moscow (laughs) it's the (laughs) most typical thing that they they actually produce like uh, this is the life of this prostitute that uh, is trying to conquer Moscow a a night's life or whatever but there are some gems I wouldn't say that Slovo Pacana is a gem uh, but it's a decent, uh, decent thing, uh, uh, and uh, mm, the only problem is that we are culturally stuck at the perestroika, trying to uh, understand what actually has happened with us. Because, um, well, it started with Balabanov, actually, this process yeah. of uh, um, self, uh, yeah, self knowledge, self. self uh, healing process or whatever because uh, Balabanov spotted uh, was the first man who started producing and directing films for the actual viewers 
and uh, he perfectly understood that his more art house uh, uh, films are not uh, will not be profitable simply put and mm -hmm. uh, he just tried to do what the audience wants and it's the uh, the soviets uh, didn't really care for it and it's the it is the weakness of the soviet film industry although it was of course great in many aspects but they did not depend on the actual uh, approval rating or whatever yeah. because every soviet person would just watch the movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> if it's a big enough movie yeah yeah and yeah. i wanted to uh, i wanted to remind our listeners and followers that you can watch um basically all of uh classic soviet uh cinema for free on youtube on the channel of most film they have been uploading their entire film archive the golden collection uh, over a thousand movies uh, soviet and russian and um all of the good ones they have uh, undergone like they have been digitally restored and they are available in glorious 4k and uh, for example all of uh, tarkovsky i think and also um, a lot of those have uh, english subtitles yeah uh, so uh, there is actually little debate going on uh, that was caused by this slow Pazana series um, and many people are saying that uh, yeah it's teaching the kids uh, wrong values because it's romanticizing the the uh, hoodlums the gangs and it will inevitably bring back them on the streets which is moronic it will never happen because it's a different world now but still and um, uh, yeah but already kind of uh, rejected it but uh, the funniest thing is that uh, the soviet movies try to educate the audience and uh, and uh, there was always a propaganda not a po of political kind but of being a proper citizen of being a good man a good child of doing right things and it didn't really uh, work because uh, the 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 street gangs of the perestroika era they all watched soviet movies and cartoons that were very good in their message but they just ignored it and formed street gangs and started assaulting people and uh, killing each other uh, so the idea that uh, the movies need to bring some good message in them i don't think that it's uh, the right one they they just need to be truthful truthful to whatever time period they're trying to portray and uh, this particular uh, series is pretty good at that because they uh, try to resurrect a lot of things from this era although uh, have you ever uh, heard the word chushpan uh yes i think i have heard but not uh, yeah, much not often really yeah. but i have heard the word yeah does it mean that uh, that uh, a person who is not in any gang though yeah it's basically in like an army from yeah. the point of view of like uh, uh, a realny patsan i think so, uh, I, yeah. I, I think in, in the usage is like a synonym of like a friar mm -hmm. so the reality of uh, at hand it, it was not only in perestroika though the the street gangs of kids were a mainstay were uh, a yeah, typical for a long feature time. of yeah. uh, the Soviet city. So every Soviet city was a dangerous place to for a Russian a Soviet kid to actually. Uh, well, he couldn't go to a uh, wrong neighborhood. It it was dangerous at night. Uh, you would be assaulted by those gangs uh, at every step and. Uh, yeah, in Moscow, it was funny that uh, a lot of regional gangs, especially yeah. that were close to Moscow, would come during the weekend to Moscow and would assault like MGU students and rob <laughs> them and take the, their shoes off and uh, coats or whatever, to steal hats. Uh, it was uh, pretty typical for 
a Russian woman to uh, have her full, full head stolen uh, by uh, those hoodlums. So uh, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> my, uh, the stories of my father about his childhood are wild, and it's typical for all men from like the 60s or the 70s. And uh, clearly, the Soviet regime didn't really work, and the Soviet militia didn't work, uh, especially at the low level of uh, petty crime of the youth gangs. They couldn't control them. Partly because uh, there there were no uh, cameras anywhere, but uh, probably because uh, though the state propaganda didn't really reach the masses of the Soviet people, and yeah. uh, they were left to their own devices. And the fact that uh, millions of people, older people, uh, went from to the prison system, and uh, returned home with uh, new sets. Uh, a new mm, culture basically the prison culture and this prison culture is what destroyed it was this rotten core the poison that destroyed the the soviet uh, ideals in the end and it was all that was left in the 90s the prison culture yeah. so yeah <clears throat> but we'll leave uh, the more broader discussion of that when kirill actually watch, uh, watches the series and uh, how yeah. many episodes is it uh, uh, it's uh, i think six episodes are out now ah, okay yeah. and ah, the, they, uh, like they didn't drop the whole season at once so no just, no they uh, didn't okay. yeah okay i am uh, currently uh, uh busy watching um uh, two other shows actually which um uh not russian uh, I am um, expanding my, um, um, how to put it, my knowledge of classic anime by, by watching oh. Serial Experiments Lane. And I am mm -hmm. also watching the new Fago season. Uh, Fago new Fargo season? My, yes, Fago is going. one of my... It, yeah, it's uh, one of my favorite uh, shows ever, really. And but... the... Mm -hmm. New season is really good. It's much better than the last one so far. Um, well, yeah. The serial experiments of Lane, uh, well, it ca came off as very boring when I tried to watch it like 10 years ago. Uh, it's kind of weird and boring. Uh, yeah, my, my fiance actually made me watch it with her like four or five years ago and i didn't like it back then either way i would dropped it after one episode but uh, this time i'm uh, working better we're watching we've been watching it and mm. uh, i like it's pretty good pretty good as to fargo uh, i have uh, watched the first season of fargo mm -hmm. but it's it doesn't really stand in comparison to movie fargo by by cohen brothers uh, well, I think the current season has very mov Fargo movie vibes. Mm. It's a very Cohen brothery, and yeah, I'm enjoying it very much. I'm actually gonna watch the uh, last night's episode today. Well, yeah, that's probably the only region that is comparable to Russia. Yeah. Well, most of <laughs> Russia, right in America. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I wonder, does it has, uh, ha have the same effect on the local people? Uh, are they more Russian-like? We need to <laughs> do a cultural examination yeah. and go to yeah, Fargo we're... sometime in the future. Yeah, we're... <laughs> it's a real city, right? Yes, yes. It's in mm. uh, North Dakota, I think. Yes, I think mm -hmm. it's in North Dakota. Well, Americans are great at popularizing their little cities and towns and states, and that's what uh, we should learn from them. And uh, I think Russian directors are learning uh, why, uh, by picturing other places than Moscow now. Yeah, they yeah. have finally figured it out that uh, <laughs> you shouldn't be ashamed of it. And Fargo is, yeah, it's a tiny city. It's Well, it's a 100,000 strong city. Maybe mm. the biggest in north dakota isn't it yeah, yeah. it is the biggest yeah. city in north dakota well it just goes to show my point that uh, it's pretty unique for extreme cold 
places to have more than even a hundred thousand, but uh, more than a million, it's unheard of. Mm -hmm. Because all the Canadian cities are pretty mild, climate-wise. But, okay, uh, I think this is enough for this live stream. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for your interesting messages. And, um, yeah, 